tonight I want to talk about four ways to let go. Uh, last week, I talked about the great process, really, of um, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, gradual cultivation, sudden awakening, kind of as an upward spiral. These are two great themes in our practice, and they support each other. Central to both of these, both to gradual cultivation and to sudden awakening, including that awakening to the good news that's always been there beneath the surface, right you know, in front of our eyes, in effect, the good news about our own deep nature. Um, letting go is central to both of these. Uh, as Ajahn Chah, who I quoted early on in the meditation, as saying that meditation is a process of being aware while letting go, aware and letting go, he said that if you let go a little, you'll have a little peace. Then Ajahn Chah continued to say, if you let go a lot, you'll have a lot of peace. And if you let go completely, you will be completely peaceful. Ah. So let's explore four ways to let go. Of course, letting go is a practice we do inside our own minds. Meanwhile, out there in the world, we can certainly take action, we can take strong action, including action that might look like you know, gathering things together or holding on. I think of my own experience rock climbing where in a literal sense, you don't want to let go, let's say. But internal to ourselves, even as we are deliberate and focused, even fiery on behalf of others or ourselves, internally, there can be an ongoing releasing of things that cause suffering and harm. So we're going to be exploring that here. Uh, to make this more experiential, and concrete and specific for you, um, I suggest that you pick something that's been bothering you. Maybe from your past, but it's still there when you reflect on it. It still er, is upsetting. Or maybe something currently, some way you felt wronged or you've been struggling with a desire for something that's not so good for you or others, or just something that you're contracted about or it's been bothering you. And I'll use an example myself, one that I can relate to personally. It'll be a more general example, not a specific one, about um, what to do when you, someone else truly has mistreated you, has uh, been dismissive or hurtful, disrespectful, uh, not treated oneself with respect, say. And understandably, there are reactions to that. Um, so Let's use these examples as I go through this. And to make a key point, when we let go, it's not because there's something bad about our reactions that we're trying to ugh, get rid of. It's not about that at all. In fact, trying to get rid of something is kind of the opposite of genuinely releasing it. Um, what I'm focused on here are those experiences, those thoughts, those feelings, those patterns of reaction, patterns of grasping, patterns of craving that burden us, weigh us down, you know, cause the heart to contract, create reactivity at other people that causes suffering in them as well. That's what we're focusing on here. Okay, so first, letting go in the body. So let's suppose that someone in my world or you could use your own example here, has done something and there's understandably a kind of a reaction. Ugh. The body contracts, it tenses. There are certain patterns of sensation, holding, even movement that underlie somatic patterns, somatic markers that underlie um, reactions of thought and emotion. Um, so that's happening in the body multiple ways to let go in the body. And I'm gonna name some major ones here. Exhaling. You can feel the difference as soon as you exhale, kind of generally. You can also exhale specifically, like exhaling tension related to something or exhaling, you can imagine, you know, smoggy, you know, smoky, icky air coming out of you, visualizing that as you release um, different reactions in your body to something. 
exhaling. And as we exhale, interestingly, the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system gets particularly engaged, and that branch, the parasympathetic branch, is naturally calming and easing. And as we exhale, naturally, the heart rate slows a little. It tends to speed up a little when we inhale. So, ah, exhaling. A second way to let go in the body is to soften or release or relax or ease in your body in general, even through progressive methods like starting at your feet, moving up to your head, or starting at your head or moving down, or imagining that your body is like a vessel with valves in the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes. And as you release tension, as you release holding in the body, it's as if there's orange liquid in your body and it marks any particular places in your body that are tense or held, and you release them, you let them go. Um, also, you can look for particular patterns of holding. Like for me, if someone um, has kind of attacked me or let me down, it can feel like getting punched in the stomach. Ugh. There's a natural sort of slumping around the wound, the hurt. Ugh. And as we let go in the body, in this example, there can be a releasing of that contraction, that understandable curling over and there can be a movement or a gesture that reflects a kind of letting go, like sitting up a little straighter or letting go of something in the hands. Imagining the upset or the pain or the problematic desire is like a stone, a heavy stone. Oh, there could be a kind of gesture of flicking. My dad had a kind of gesture when he was alive of kind of flicking his hand to the side, like, you know, like brushing away a bug or just let go of that, Rick. You don't need to fuss with that. Just letting go. Um, last, in terms of letting go in the body, it's a little subtler to talk about, but there can be just a kind of surrender, a surrender overall to what is. It is what it is, truly. <sighs> you know, like, uh, you know, letting go of bracing, letting go of pushing away, letting go of aversion in the body, letting go of contraction in this just kind of, huh, I give up. It doesn't, I give up to what's true. It doesn't mean that I'm giving up my skillful efforts to stand against what's problematic or to um, keep pursuing the good as I see it. Uh, but there's a kind of, Ah, surrender to, it is the way it is. Ah, that's a kind of general and deep form of letting go in the body. Okay? And obviously, many people have taught very deeply about these various methods. I'm going to kind of move through these in a summary way, hopefully one that's useful to you. Okay. So second, letting go of craving. And these are the two that we explored in the meditation. As you may know, uh, there's the Buddha's teaching and his second noble truth that most suffering comes at bottom from craving in one form or another. What did he mean by craving or the word in Pali, tanha, whose root is thirst, that's translated as craving typically in English. We could think of it craving as a kind of insisting, uh, a kind of you know, grasping or fighting away or clinging. These are all different ways of talking about aspects of craving, including subtle forms. So why do we crave? This is where modern psychology and biology and neurobiopsychological ways of looking at things grounded in evolution can be really helpful. It is animals who crave. Animals, including big monkeys like us. And why do animals crave? Well, craving is what's called a drive state that's based on an underlying sense of deficit or disturbance, something missing, something wrong, in the meeting of an important need. We crave when we feel our needs are unmet, um, you know, in a fundamental way. Well, what do we need? different models of needs. A fundamental biological model is that all animals, including us, need, in ways according to their own species, need safety, don't get eaten today, 
need satisfaction, get fed today, and need connection, you know, find someone to shelter with and perhaps to mate with today. Safety, satisfaction, connection. These are fundamental needs uh, that we manage broadly by avoiding harms for safety, approaching rewards for satisfaction, and attaching to others in various ways for connection. All right. So fundamentally, we need to be safe, satisfied, and connected when we're enlightened. We still need to be safe, satisfied, and connected. And it's important to appreciate that we can pursue these needs without necessarily craving, particularly as we feel resourced inside with various capabilities and strengths that we can draw upon to meet our needs effectively without falling back into fear and anger related to meeting our need for safety or falling into disappointment and drivenness for our need for satisfaction or falling into shame and resentment in terms of meeting our needs for connection. We crave less when we feel in the core that our needs are being adequately met in the present. In other words, when we feel sufficiently safe, satisfied, and connected in the present. This is a big topic. So how can we let go of craving for safety? Remembering that we can pursue safety for ourselves and others without contracting into you know, fear and anger, even if those kind of swirl around the periphery of our consciousness. How to do that? There are a variety of practices. I've, I've written and taught a lot about this territory, um, which I think is foundational both in Buddhist practice, uh, which is our framework here, and also in being resilient and sustaining well-being in a challenging world. Meanwhile, here I'll be a little summary. In terms of letting go of fear or anger, so let's suppose that I've been mistreated, or in your example, whatever that may be, it really helps to recognize that in the present, to the extent you are, recognize that you're basically all right right now. That's immediately calming. Yes, there may be challenges to safety. There may be threats. Yes, there may be mistreatment that you've got to figure out what to do about. But in the present, unless you're not, if you're basically okay, whew, resting in that as a way of letting go any sense of being flooded by fear or anger. It's also helpful to see threats accurately, and not overestimate them, not underestimate them, of course, but to not you know, overestimate them and recognize that often whatever bad has happened is no longer in the present. It's not here anymore. You may know the kind of Zen story, I'll be succinct, in which uh, in the framework of the Zen story is Japan a thousand years ago. So please understand that framework. Um, two monks are walking along a very muddy trail and they come to a swollen river where uh, a beautiful young woman is. The monks have taken vows of celibacy to, you know, for the duration certainly of their own training. The senior of the two monks offers to carry this uh, woman across the river. So he carries her across the river she accepts his offer. He sets her down, continues up the trail. The younger and less trained of the two monks is now agitated internally. How dare he break his vows of celibacy? You know, how dare he carry her soft body in his arms? How, how dare he? How dare he be so close to her? And then finally, um, after a mile or two, the younger monk bursts out in agitation, says all this, and the younger, the older monk, the senior monk, looks at him and says, I hear you, and I set her down on the other side of the river, but you've been carrying her ever since. Often we carry our fear or our anger about things long after they've actually passed. Can we let that go and come into the present? Can we form good plans for what we're going to do, and rather than being helpless, can we take appropriate action in the present toward to deal with whatever has threatened us or attacked us? Can we do that 
And knowing that we have a good plan and knowing that we're doing what we can, let it go. Let it go. Centering in a sense of calm strength and resting, resting deeply in a fundamental sense of, of calm and peace. That's a way to let go related to cravings for safety. We can also let go related to cravings for satisfaction. In particular, letting go of disappointment and drivenness. Cravings for satisfaction identified or marked by cravings for uh, disappointment you know, and drivenness. So one way into that is to get a sense of enough already. There's enough already. It'd be nice to have more, got it? Knowing you can still pursue your goals, you can still dream big dreams, aspire, swing for the fences without contracting around it. And while also feeling a thankfulness and a gratitude, even a sense of awe and wonder at all that already is, even as you take more steps toward your goals, including steps toward your goals that involve helping others along the way. So feeling an enoughness, a sufficiency in the present, feeling a sense of thankfulness and gratitude, knowing that you can make plans and pursue them without you know, contracting around it, without feeling pressured. Pressure is a major indicator of cravings for satisfaction, internal pressure or pressure externally directed, demands, insistences, letting go of that, being aware of so many goals already fulfilled so that you can come home to and rest in contentment. Also, third, in terms of you know, letting go relating to craving, letting go of craving related to our need for connection. Cravings marked by a sense of shame or resentment swirling around your mind. And what helps here is to release, releasing shame or resentment and replacing or that or opening into a sense of, honestly, goodwill a fundamental sense of good-heartedness and your own natural goodness already. There's a major alternative to or replacement for shame and ill will. So in terms of inadequacy, there can be a knowing that whatever was to be learned, you can learn. Whatever there was to have a genuine sense of appropriate remorse for, you can have remorse for while moving into forgiving yourself. You know, the, the giving, the letting go of forgiving yourself related to things you might feel inadequate about. And you can know that in your own place, you can continue to learn and to grow. With resentment, letting go of fantasies of vengeance, uh, letting go of, you know, an attachment to grievance and all the rewards in that, the secondary gains, therapists say, knowing that you can assert yourself, you can combine strength with heart, but without tipping into hatred or aggression. The Buddha really emphasized the craving related to ill will, not goodwill, ill will. So we can let go of ill will, replacing it with goodwill, with a sense of self-respect and gravity knowing that you can stand up for yourself, which promotes letting go of anger at others, knowing that you will stand up for yourself while resting in a sense of love. Now, certainly I understand that these are big practices, but it's very helpful to have these roadmaps, which you know I'm trying to share with you and which draw upon certainly teachings I've received myself. So then we have the third, way to let go. And I'm going to move into subtler and in a way harder to talk about, but actually more profound even, ways of letting go. Third, we can let go in the mind. What do I mean by that? We can recognize that all experiences, hearing, seeing, you know, feeling hurt, getting angry, 
forming plans, you know, writing angry emails in your mind, you know, planning to draw others into your campaign against the person who did you dirt in various problematic ways. Those experiences, they're there, right? There is hearing, there is seeing, there is wanting, there is remembering, there is being reactivated. You know, there are sensations in the body and all of those experiences, if we simply observe them mindfully, all experiences are impermanent, they're dynamic, they're changing, they're, you know, they're quivering, they're, you know, they're humming, they, they end, they begin, they end. All experiences are impermanent. All experiences are made of parts. We can kind of deconstruct them. We can tease apart the threads that form a reaction to somebody. And they occur, all experiences occur interdependently in relationship with other experiences and the whole wide world. So that experiences have the quality of clouds. They're swirly. They're made up of parts. They come and they go. Their edges are soft and kind of blur into other things. Uh, they are cloud-like rather than brick-like. And in the technical term in Buddhism, they are empty of solidity. They are empty of essence or absolute self-existence. They're, they're there, but they're there like clouds in a swirly, swirly, empty sort of way. And this recognition is not philosophical. It's very experiential. It's like you're looking closely at them. And as we see them, see our reactions as foamy, cloudy, swirling, made of parts, changing, rather than solid, weighty, and oppressive, as we see them in this way, there, there's a letting go in relationship to the experience. It's there, but we're not so identified with it. And because we don't relate to it as solid anymore, we're not trying to hold on to it or push it away, right? And in that, this fundamental way that's grounded in vipassana, insight into the nature of all experiences, they naturally tend to disperse. They don't seem so heavy. You know, if I'm angry at someone who has mistreated me and I look closely at the experience of anger, hmm, thoughts about them, the meaning of what happened, the interpretation of what happened, emotions, different kinds of emotions related to those thoughts, hmm, desires related to those thoughts and emotions, uh, body sensations that kind of track those thoughts and emotions and desires. Uh, and as I look at it in that way, as made up of parts, as kind of dynamic and changing, as occurring more impersonally, it just doesn't feel so afflictive. There's a letting go and easing. In this recognition, the clouds of various experiences, even ones that seem pretty darn intense, and persistent, gradually disperse. They, we feel less burdened by them, less pushed by them. And as these clouds disperse, as clouds in reality, you know, disperse, the sky is revealed. The field of awareness, simply awareness is revealed in which these, sky, these clouds of experiences have come and gone. And what we become aware of as we let go of the clouds of experiences is the spaciousness and all rightness of awareness that was always, always, always already there, and in which there's a, a great peacefulness, the ongoingness and spaciousness of awareness, resting increasingly in it. Okay? And then... The fourth way of letting go is the hardest to talk about. It's the most ultimate, it's the most profound. And this is not just letting go in the mind through insight into our experiences. We're not trying to change them. We're simply having insight into them. In addition to letting go in the mind, we can let go of the mind, letting go of the mind altogether. Be careful with this practice. 
if you're at all prone to dissociation, depersonalization, derealization, or psychosis. With that caution, I'm going to talk about a step that's widely understood in contemplative training. Different paths talk about it in different ways. Um, it's kind of challenging to talk about, so I'm going to try to do my best here. Basically, letting go of the mind involves the recognition that the mind process, there is a mind process, there is hearing, there is seeing, there is the emergence of the sense of I, there is the dispersing of the sense of I, there is awareness, right? It is ongoing, it is occurring, There's a, and it's associated with a particular body. Well, the mind process of me is distinct from the mind process, say, of Jessica or Kathy or Dan. Um, okay. This mind process, call it consciousness broadly, awareness and its contents. The mind process, consciousness, is definitely occurring with a particular body while also knowing that the mind process, consciousness, occurs interdependently with nature and culture and physical reality. In other words, the mind process does not cause itself. Consciousness does not cause itself. This mind, this mind, your mind, is part of a vaster process. So you can let go of it. You can let go in relationship to it. It's there. It's happening. It's a local expression of a vaster process. And in this recognition, there can be a letting go. There are these wonderful instructions of a particular form of meditation from Tibet. Let go of the past. Let go of the future. Let go of the present. And leave your mind alone. That's of the character. That's this. This is an encouragement that's uh, along the lines of what I'm talking about here. Knowing that the mind has many, many elements, the mind process, consciousness has many, many elements, doesn't it? Just ah, so many threads knitting together the momentary tapestry of consciousness. Knowing that it has many, many elements and is therefore empty of essence, you can let go of trying to control it tightly. It's beyond your control. <laughs> you can influence some of the threads here and there, but the mind process altogether, it's true, isn't it? It, it has a mind of its own, <laughs> in its own way. And knowing in the deepest sense that your consciousness is not actually your own. It's there. This is not nihilism. This is not a void. It's there. But in a fundamental sense, this, this consciousness related to particular body is not yours. It's not your own. It's there. It's occurring without an owner or director. So you can lighten up about it. Now, meanwhile, as I've taught, and you can explore my material on relaxing the sense of self, it's important to do what's appropriate to respect persons, particular body-mind processes associated with a particular body and a particular name tag. You know, treating oneself with respect, internalizing social supplies like feeling seen or cherished or really valued by other people, internalizing those, you know, to help release suffering and allow the contracted clench of the apparent self to ease, to relax. There's a place for all that. I'm not talking about disrespecting persons or um, allowing others to disrespect you. I'm just talking about the fourth and perhaps the the subtlest and vastest form of letting go, letting go of the mind uh, in which we allow this mind 
to gradually ease and quiet into a much vaster process of being that extends ultimately out into everything, resting in mystery. Okay, so letting go in the body, letting go of craving, letting go in the mind, and letting go of the mind. All right, questions or comments? Um, I see hands, and I'm going to do a quick scan in the chat. Very good. I can see that you're tracking what I'm talking about, which is reassuring. <laughs> um, very good. Very, very good. You can see what people have said in the chat. And um, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, great, great. This is Jackie at 7.12 p.m., 7.12 Pacific time. It raises a very important point. It's a really important. What if, in effect, the holding on of hurts is based on early life experiences and they actually serve a function as a part of developing? And this is a very important point. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Jackie. As with anything I teach, you take it you know, with a grain of salt and adapt it to your own situation. Um, Sometimes we need to hold on to the sense of being mistreated because it strengthens us, for example, to deal with ongoing mistreatment, to hold on to the sense of injustice, to fuel um, our efforts to make things better, and to help us not get sucked into a sense of, oh, I'm a bad person, they have a right to do that, blah, blah, blah. So let's be really clear. There's a place for holding on to things. And so I'm, you know, letting go is to be applied to what in your wisdom feels appropriate to you to let go of, which could be letting go of ways you learned to cope in years past that you can replace with, you know, ways of coping that maybe are more nuanced, uh, more flexible, more nimble and adaptable, less caught up with effective but problematic forms of you know, suffering. Uh, and it's really helpful, by the way, to build these other ways of coping before you let go of old ways of coping. It's sort of like if you're in a rowboat that's kind of old and contracted and sort of leaky and it's tilted to one side, but it floats, it floats. Don't just sink your rowboat before you build a better boat you know, a better vehicle for coping and taking care of yourself and taking care of others. And then you can gradually step from the old vehicle into the new vehicle. You can let go of that old into the new. And that's a very, very important point. I really appreciate Jackie bringing it up. Okay. So I'm seeing very good um, comments. Excellent. If Audrey brings up, uh, and I'll finish with Audrey, then I'll take your question, Zoom user, um, who you have a hand up. I'll take yours in a moment. From Audrey, what's your recommendation for those who have an early history of dissociation? Um, <clears throat> my recommendation initially is to actually focus on holding on, <laughs> gathering together, in a sense, in the in the primacy of the body. You know. Interoception is useful. Tuning into ongoing sensations in the body is grounding and reassuring. You're still here. You're still going on being. That that's helpful. So you kind of you help yourself come together, and you also grow resources that enable you to deal with threats um, and including invasive experiences without leaving, without dissociating in subtle ways or even in you know, really far-reaching, even catastrophic ways. So by building up resources to deal with various challenges and building up a sense of cohering as a body-mind, as a being, it's really interesting. There's this line, you need to be somebody before you can become nobody. You know, I think that was from Jack Engler, a psychologist and an early Buddhist teacher and practitioner. Um, 
And so by building up those two kind of resources, Audrey and others, we can strengthen our capacity for association. So then we can become more able to let go and release in ways that are helpful to us. Okay. So I see two people. I'm going to call uh, on Zoom user. That's your identification. And so I'm asking you to unmute. Can you unmute yourself? And when I call on you, it's it's really good just to remind everybody, try to be succinct so we have time for other people and you know get to what whatever the topic or, or question might be. Okay, please. Um, well, first I want to thank you. This is so, so profound for me. Oh, um, good. And I feel like you've been with me all day because this morning I was listening to um, you and Forrest. Our son, a co-host of the Being Well podcast. That's sweet. And as a dad, you really touched my heart. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, so, so here's my question about what you've, just what you said. So um, I am unpracticed at how to protect myself mm. um, or be in situations where I feel threatened um, uh, or and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I only know the practices that I have, right? Yeah, that's right, of course. And that's really important. You, you're, you're teaching here. This is really true right. what you're saying, yeah. But, you know, you were saying, okay, build up other things build up practice different practices before you switch yeah i don't see how that's possible so the only thing that i see yeah. which is in life is i have to fail okay i have to drop what wasn't working and i'm not going to be a master already at something i've never done before so i have to fail I have to do exactly what I've been terrified of. And the reason I have these very unhelpful practices in the first place, which is I'm going to be annihilated. Well, let me, I'm going if to I be could annihilated. Pause. Yeah. I'm going to be my armor's off, belly up to the, you know, bare belly to the sword. Yeah. Now, let me ask you quickly. Are you, let me be real clear, I'm trying to understand this. It is true, I think, that sometimes, as they say, we have to hit bottom, you know, of one kind or thing or another. And there are practices like in Zen that really try to push people who are well-resourced to the edge so that when they do fail in their typical MO, their typical way of being, there's a, there can be an, an opening into, you know, a vast, wonderful oneness. Great. On the other hand, I'm not, are you talking about you feel that your, your training as it were, your conditioning is, is that you have to fail? Is that what you're saying? No, what I, um, let's see if I can make, so. Um, Cause I can think of resources, especially if you, we, we were be, to be specific, you know, that you could develop any, that we could all, I've developed, so that as I built them up, I became more and more willing to take risks uh, that involved letting go of old ways of being, because I felt more and more confident about the new ways of being I was growing. Okay, so um, thinking both in business and personal, but kind of um, um, being a, uh, um, Emotionally exploited. Uh, uh, so let me pause. If I could. Yep, yep. So let's let's take a basic skill, and I and and a very fundamental one. It's it's very central, which is to reserve the right to turn away, to say no. And we we start by saying no in ourselves quietly. And then we may we then go to saying no to others about the thing that's coming at us that's hard to say no to, right? It's hard to refuse. 
It's, you know, it's hard to say no, and I'm using the word no in general. And then eventually we work up to saying no to the person. I had to actually, after many years of personal growth in my mid twenties, by that point, I had to really work hard to make myself say no to my father about something. And I created an artificial situation over the telephone in which I made myself say the word no to him, which was extremely, I was very censored and suppressed about that. Okay, so that would be a resource that one could grow. And rela related to which would be other resources like thoughts that you are entitled to say no. Maybe by realizing there's a general principle that people in general, uh, women in general, certainly you in particular, can say no, it's important to say no. If we can't say no, what does our yes actually mean? So for example, that would be something that could develop you know, including the body language, you know, you can just think of all kinds of ways, you know, holding up the hand, uh, you know, turning away, averting the gaze, shaking one's head, different ways of practicing the freedom, the, the healthy entitlement to say no, building that up, and then starting to draw upon that when other people would try to take advantage of you. So, right. So, but what I'm talking about actually is that I have done that to the point where um, what I wrote is I'm skilled at, I am unskilled at, at standing up for myself without hardness. So my reaction okay. because good. of what good. happened now is mm -hmm. no. So now, and I'm going to finish off. on this. I'm going to finish on this one. So it's very nuanced what you're saying. You have a lot of self awareness. Great, fantastic. Build on. Uh, then can you train in uh, the capacity to say no, strength with heart? I know. You know. That's right. That's the vulnerable. Yeah, and that that's I really tricky, especially again. It's easy for me to say because I'm a dude with a lot of privilege and power. Blah blah. You know, and it's just like super acknowledged. It can be a lot harder for a lot of other people. You know, for example, many women trained in very different ways and treated in really different ways. But still, there can be, you know, finding one's own way, including sometimes looking out for models uh, where there's a certain gravitas, a certain dignity in it, you know, and self-respect with also a certain um, not going to war with the other person. And um, you know, retaining what was a certain. That again? No, I'm joking. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Are you from the East Coast? <laughs> anyway, okay, I've got to finish. I want to go to Jack. We're, then we're going to finish close to on time. But but that was cool. But exactly right. You're exactly right. We learn these nuances. We kind of grow into them. We don't really grow into them yet fully. But then we. It's kind of a two. It's a two step process. As we grow into the new, we gradually disengage from the old. And then increasingly, we're established in the new. Sometimes we get triggered, re-triggered back into the old, especially if it's a, if it really comes at us and hits us hard or catches us in our vulnerable place. You know, um, our mother calls us <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, our ex is on the phone. Um, but on the whole, we really do establish ourselves in these new ways of being. And then as we do that, yes, increasingly we can let go. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, really appreciate that. Okay, Jack, your turn asked to unmute you uh, succinctly, and then we'll finish up. Okay, I was, my question is, uh, what role do you think uh, basic trust has to do with letting go? Huh, so great. it seemed to me that you, you would need to be like a faith in a certain kind of inner efficacy that you would have to be able to say, let go of a certain craving that you feel you're missing something. And even with the, the inner consciousness, that's, you know, the unconditioned consciousness that's not given to us, it would seem a trust in that process too. Oh yeah. Uh, because you don't feel it's like really, yeah. you know, you feel like there's nothing there, nothing, you'd be really, really vulnerable. It's like, it's really hard to take that leap. Yeah. Well, if uh, Jack, you're a therapist, right? You're talking about basic trust? No, I'm not. Well, oh, I'm very retired. interesting. Okay, okay. Um, so kind of succinctly, it's the less that we have a bone deep sense in, in feeling supported imperfectly, but relatively adequately by the universe, notably other people, 
the less we have that sense, as our plaintive cat walks by my open door here, the less we have that sense, the scarier it is to let go. You know, if you in your bones feel like you're always walking on thin ice and something could come out of left field at any moment, get you, because it did when you were young, or it still does today, you know, of course, it's harder to, to let go. That's why I think it's really helpful to keep appreciating and tuning into the felt sense of being alert and aware and strengthening that sense. Uh, being clear about your own capabilities, being aware of where you do have allies, where there are resources of different kinds, you know, and being in touch with that and being in touch with various strengths, including the strengths of your companion. Hello, Pistachio. Say hello to the crowd. Anyway, the strengths of your companions so that you can let go. And so it's particularly difficult to do this when you, when the lower layers of your psyche lack basic trust, which is, according to Eric Erickson, that first developmental stage of a fundamental, relatively reliability of support and attention and availability around you. It doesn't have to be perfect, but certainly has to be plenty good enough, not just good enough, plenty good enough for the kind of person you are, including maybe a premature, sensitive, little, little baby, okay? So what we can do though, and this is a broad, long process of personal growth and healing and if you like, spiritual practice, we help deeper and deeper layers of ourselves experience these fundamental qualities I'm describing of peacefulness, contentment, and love, right? And it deep, deep down, and that's a long process. You know, I'm probably still working on some of those deeper layers myself. And I've written about it in Hardwiring Happiness and Resilient with Forrest. Um, we can do that. And in parallel to that, which I find is a wonderful parallel, the psychological and call it the spiritual in the broadest sense, the two in parallel with each other, we can kind of work with our, our learning, our programming, you know, deeply embedded in our body, while also widening into a wider and wider perspective. Uh, and the two can, can work together. And then as they work together, um, we become more, more able to let go. And here's the last point I wanna leave you with. It's like the mind, is a, like a big house with many rooms. And in these many rooms, including some way down in the basement, very young rooms, there can be feelings in those rooms, there can be beliefs in those rooms, voices calling out from those rooms that are legitimate in those rooms, they make sense. While in other rooms, maybe more adult parts of us that are more in the present, have certain kinds of wisdom, have understanding, recognize that this is now, that was then, you know, recognize capabilities of various kinds. Those other parts of us know, let's say the first person, you know, who spoke up, know that it actually would be almost certainly safe to make a vulnerable request that carries an implicit criticism and complaint in it of an important person with a certain vulnerability and softness and knows in this room that it will most likely go okay and that it's a worthy experiment to try. Both because it'll tell you something about that other person if they're an asshole <laughs> and most likely it'll go well and that's something important to internalize, okay? So that room you know, maybe up in the cockpit, whoever, wherever that is, that room knows what's true, even as that little kid inside is screaming, no, 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 never trust him, forget it, right? But we still go ahead anyway. We don't need to completely heal and clear away every single room in the mansion of the mind to still act helpfully and skillfully and appropriately, you know, each day. And that's wonderfully hopeful. And part of it, is we bring these other parts of ourselves along with us. 
as, as we learn and grow and move forward in life. Letting go along the way. Okay. So thanks, Zach. Thanks, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Uh, let's finish up now, okay? Um, I, I see questions coming in. I'm sorry. I just better wrap up for everybody's sake. And so let's say goodbye. Uh, but as we say goodbye, before we say goodbye, how about taking a big breath? I'm going to do it with you. And exhale and let go. Letting go of complications, you know, and letting go into whatever feels real in your body about what we've explored tonight. What you know or can know into that's true and useful for you. Letting go of complications, confusions, letting into what feels right, whatever feels right and true for you. Letting it land. Okay.